Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday webinar series, Lunch with the Birds. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Amanda Conover. I'm the program coordinator for the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. I'm going to be um, introducing your presenters today. And um, But before I did that, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative and then also about some of our upcoming webinars in this series. Uh, the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative is a coalition of about 100 organizations within Ohio and um, some regional partners as well. Um, we have state and federal agencies, nonprofit groups, um, schools, businesses, all kinds of organizations that sign on to support our mission to, um, to build partnerships for bird conservation projects uh, across Ohio. Um, these pictures here are just some of the projects that we've been working on across the state. Uh, we recently released a Managing Forest Birds in Southeast Ohio book, which was written by Amanda Rodewald. We are um, working with the Ohio Ornithological Society on a project to install uh, kestrel boxes on the backs of highway signs. We also um, co-coordinate the Lights Out Columbus program with um, the Grange Insurance Audubon Center. But I invite you to um, visit our website at obcinet.org to learn some more um, about our projects. Um, this series is brought to you by our Outreach and Education Committee. And here's a look at some of our upcoming webinars. Um, I will be presenting um, next month, May 15th, um, on finding solutions to window collisions. I'll be sharing some of the results from our Lights Out Columbus Collision Monitoring Program and then offering some home remedies um, to, present, to prevent window collisions um, at your home. And then we're also looking forward to our presentation in June by Tim Daniel from the Ohio Division of Wildlife, who will be sharing with us some field techniques in the digital age, um, some tips and tricks for um, photography um, out in nature. And again, there's our web link to uh, take a look at our upcoming webinars um, on our website. Before I introduce our presenters, I want to just go over a few um, logistical things here. You are all muted. Uh, at the moment, but if you have any questions, feel free to enter those into your chat box in the uh, lower left-hand corner there. You can either send them to the whole group or send them to just the presenters. And our presenters will be um, addressing those questions um, at the end of their presentation. So with us here today, um, our, pres our presenters are Paula Vibarth and Darlene Silic. Paula is a resident of Powell and South Bath Island. She began developing and monitoring bluebird trails in 2002 and also does purple martin conservation work, including monitoring, advising, and data collection in Central Ohio and South Bath Islands. Paula serves on um, OBCI's Outreach and Education Committee. She's the Delaware County Area Contact for Ohio Bluebird Society and Cornell Nestwatch Chapter Coordinator. She monitors numerous trails for bluebirds and tree swallows and serves as the monitor coordinator for Preservation Parks of Delaware County, Stratford Ecological Center, Liberty Township, and Sheaf East Point Nature Preserve. Um, Paula also presents educational programs at, on cavity nesting birds for children and adults, including training for bluebird monitors. Our second presenter here uh, with us today is Darlene Silic. Darlene also lives in Powell and works as Senior Executive Assistant for the Chief Information Officer at Cardinal Health in Dublin. Um, for about 25 years, she's worked with numerous nonprofit and nature-related organizations, sharing her passion for birds and people. Um, she's presently a, a trustee and the program chair for Columbus Audubon. She's an advisor with the Ohio Young Birders Club and chair of OBC, OBCI's Outreach and Education Committee. She is a lifetime member of Ohio Bluebird Society and has given countless bluebird and secondary cavity nesting workshops. She's worked for almost 20 years to put up nest boxes for a variety of secondary cavity species from purple martin to prothonotary warblers and has also been banding for nine years under professors from two universities. So without further ado, I will um, turn it over here to Paula and Darlene for their presentation of Nest boxes for birds. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, this is Darlene, and while Amanda gets us back to our first slide, um, just a couple things. Like Amanda said, I've been 
doing this for 25 years, a couple things that I really enjoy doing are setting up trails and large trails. Uh, so I enjoy doing conservation projects. And I have really um, had a lot of fun doing this with the Ohio Young Birders Club and also with, with other groups from, Metro, from the Franklin County Metro Parks um, to helping Paula up at Chief. Um, South Bass Island. So um, let's get on with the show here. And Paula, do you want to jump in before we start? You want to say anything? Well, just as far as monitoring it, really Amanda covered everything I do for the most part, but uh, I just checked all my boxes uh, yesterday to let you know how many I'm monitoring so far this week. Uh, 177 nest boxes weekly and 150 purple martin compartments. So, so I've been busy, busy this time of year. Okay, so jumping into slide two, we're not going to read everything that's on these slides. You can do that, and it's documented and recorded. But you know, we're working with secondary cavity nesters, our native secondary cavity nesters. Um, we're not going to get into a whole lot about um, the non-natives, but we will touch on it just a little bit. So, so good nest box design criteria. It's really, really important to have a well-made nest box. Not just any nest box will do. So you want it to be watertight. It doesn't have to be made of cedar, but I have uh, been involved with building over 6,000 nest boxes for a variety of different species, and 90% of the time I'm using cedar. Um, you want to use thick lumber, and that adds to the warmth, and it also helps to keep the birds cool with the thicker wood. Um, you want to secure the door with a Phillips screw, not just with a slotted screw or nail. Um, most of the trails that I'm working on are in very public areas, and uh, that helps to keep curiosity um, peers out. You do not want to perch. The perch it makes it easy for predators to get a hold. Uh, you also want a roof that overhangs. If you could have anywhere from five to seven inches of an overhang, um, it's really helpful in preventing some of the avian predators from reaching into the boxes. Um, you want a climbing ladder or curves, and as you can see in this photo, it's the lines that are under the hole in the inside of the box, and that enables the birds with their weak legs to climb out, uh, especially the tree swallows when they come back. They're sometimes in a, a weakened state. Um, you want to mount the hole facing south, southeast, out of the north, northwest weather, and you want to have a predator baffle on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll talk first here about the, I call it the poster bird for native secondary cavity nesting birds, the eastern bluebird here in Ohio. Um, everyone would love to have an eastern bluebird nesting with them. It seems like uh, many people, that, that's what they're aiming to get. Um, it's uh, the topic of songs and poetry and a sign of spring, many people consider it. In central Ohio, uh, eastern bluebird actually does overwinter with me there, and I do feed them in the winter. Uh, so it's neat to see them in the, in the snow also. Um, back when the settlers first arrived in this country, the eastern bluebird was as common as an, the American robin is today. And they did suffer a decline uh, due to a number of factors, mainly man-made or man-caused factors with their lowest population in 1963, and they have rebounded quite a bit uh, due to conservation efforts and, and uh, just stopping the usage of things like DDT and other stupid things we tend to do. <laughs> this is the male eastern bluebird. You can see the uh, brilliant blue color on this bird. He's, he's gorgeous to behold. And here's the female. Uh, she's eating holly berries here. The most important consideration, really, when trying to house any native cavity nesting bird is the habitat. Uh, so for eastern bluebirds, the habitat is uh, short-mode grass. Uh, they like to have a solitary tree or perch. 
to perch on, and that tree or perch also acts as a place for the young to fledge, which fledge means to fly out of the nest box when they're all done growing. Uh, and they, that's nice for them to have that also. The reason they need the short mowed grass is these birds primarily eat ground dwelling insects, so they need to be able to find them. If you have tall grass habitat, it's going to be really hard to find food. Uh, as far as the second most important thing is territory. All of our birds have some sort of a territory requirement. And for bluebirds, they will not nest, as a general rule, any closer than 100 to 150 yards apart. When you look at these pictures briefly, the one on the left is, is a nest box sited properly with a baffle. Um, the two on the right show nice habitat. Uh, even the bottom one, which you see tall grass, but there's short mode grass behind, so they could still find food. But there's some problems with those two pictures on the right. The one on the top right, you'll see a nest box nailed to a tree, which is a huge no-no. Um, if you do that, you're basically setting out a raccoon lunchbox, and we highly recommend you don't do that. And the boxes on the bottom right, you'll see, are really spaced too close together for bluebirds. Now, it's hard to tell the exact spacing, but this could work for some other sort of native cavity nesting birds. Bluebirds, uh, they will make a nest of fine grass or pine needles or a combination thereof. I've also seen them use cherry stems and some other strange things. Um, but generally of that consistency and usually a homogeneous nest, usually the same material. They'll lay four to six pale blue eggs. We recommend that you monitor boxes every four to seven days. And Darlene will talk a little more about monitoring and what that entails later in the presentation. And it's important when you're checking birds and monitoring them that once they get close to fledging age, you shouldn't open the box because you don't want them to, to pre-fledge. If they were to do that, they might not survive in the wild. So fledge day, as I said, that's the day they leave the box. Um, and that's a exciting day. These are some great shots here. You can see that the young, when they leave the nest box, they don't really have their adult plumage yet. They won't get that until their first fall molt. Um, but the parents will actually take care of them out in the wild uh, for several weeks or more until they can find food on their own and learn, they'll gradually learn how to find food and to be a bluebird, how they need to act and, and sing and feed and what to eat. Um, you can tell the tail feathers of the bird. Go ahead, darling, you say something about that one? Yeah, just uh, the tails of the birds don't grow until after they uh, fledge from the nest. And for that two and a half to three weeks that the father's taking care of them, uh, teaching them to hunt, teaching them to fly, uh, the females building another nest. That's when their tail grows, and it's really neat the way Mother Nature has designed them to not grow in the nest box and have uh, poo all over them and soiling their feathers. So uh, it's just a neat little observation. Okay, nest boxes for eastern bluebirds. Uh, the picture on the left, that's my son, Greg. He's got autism, and his, this is his, he's working on his 100th box for Darlene. He's been building nest boxes, and, and the box you see there that he's holding, it's called, we call it the Zepic, because it was developed by Charlie Zepp and Darlene Sillick with all their years of experience uh, housing bluebirds and uh, raising bluebirds, and that's what the majority of my trail boxes are, these nest boxes, and they're great boxes made of cedar and, and some of the criteria we discussed before. Um, important for the bluebird that you have a minimum floor area of four inches by four inches, and we actually recommend higher than that. Five by five is probably ideal, um, but if you get like four and a half by five, that's good, or four by four is a minimum. Uh, they do require a minimum hole entry of one and a half inch diameter. Um, we find that they seem to prefer one and nine sixteenths inches, but you can't even go a sixteenth of an inch bigger than that, or you can let uh, European starlings in your box, and you do not want that to happen. Uh, the box on the right is the X-Box that was developed by NABS, which is the North American Bluebird Society. And plans for both these boxes are on the OBCI site, so you can access that and, and build your own. OK, um, we're going to jump into an aerial insect eater, which is the tree swallow. 
and they just recently returned from the southern part of the United States and Central America. They la like to nest near water, and they don't mind it if the grasses are tall. Um, they're just an amazing and fun bird to work with. They're a little bit more aggressive than the bluebird. Um, and if we pair the boxes to have two boxes, <clears throat> maybe 8 to 12 feet apart, we could have bluebirds and tree swallows both nest pretty much side by side. They're competing for different food, but they are helping to protect, to protect the nesting space. Um, the tree swallow used to be called the white-bellied swallow, and again, they're eating insects on the wing. Their nest is on the lower left. Uh, they start with coarse grass, and then they line the cup with feathers. Um, I did a study with Cornell a number of years ago, and they asked us to count the number of feathers in a tree swallow nest. I had as few as 38 and as many as 109. So it was uh, quite exciting, and the males will fly uh, up to a couple miles away looking for these curved white chicken and duck feathers. And of course, if they can't find white, they'll grab whatever they can. But it's really neat during nesting, uh, when the birds are constructing their nest, to go out into near the nest box with some of these feathers. And Paul and I will make a run to Michael's and buy all the feathers. Um, and then we're, of course, trying to get them from each other. You bought all the feathers. No, you bought all the feathers. But anyway, we have a lot of fun tossing feathers up. And the birds will come and grab a feather. Sometimes they'll take it right out of our hands. And they'll do this aerial ballet. And then she'll finally take the feather and stick it into her nest. So it's a really fun thing to do with, with people. I assume some of you are. Um, you know, working out in parks, and it's just awesome to do. If you have a little rise out in the area, you might go out there where you're up a little bit higher. And, um, you know, again, fun thing to do with kids. So they will lay um, four to seven white eggs, and they will sometimes nest twice. Paul and I both work with tree swallow grids. And a grid um, are the boxes faced at a right angle using the Pythagorean theorem 25 yards off each other. And it's quite exciting to see the dynamics that go on with um, maybe 16 pair of tree swallows within close proximity of each other. And it's uh, quite interesting to watch. And there aren't many mosquitoes around. So they do eat mosquitoes where your purple martins do not. Yeah, I talked about this. So next on the Carolina chickadees or black-capped chickadees, whichever you have um, nesting in your area. And I noticed several of you are from north. Barb, welcome from Michigan. That's pretty cool. So the, the chickadees are constructing their nest right now. I have, Paul and I both have it going on on our trails. And they construct a moss nest. Um, they, it, it's so neat to see them building this maybe three to four inch high moss nest. And as you can see in this picture, here's what the nest looks like. And the top layer of material is either plant down or animal fur. And one thing about the chickadees, if you're going out to monitor, gently move uh, the top layer aside so that you can see uh, the eggs, because she does cover up the eggs when she leaves the nest. And I learned the hard way the first time and kept thinking, no eggs, no eggs, no eggs. And all of a sudden, I had babies. So uh, I learned that that's part of her MO. Um, you can reduce the entry hole to one and an eighth if you have some of the uh, larger secondary cavity nesters trying to enter the box. They do like the wood edge um, or just inside the woods. And they're nesting uh, in April. And by the end of May, they have finished. And they just nest once, and they lay seven to nine eggs. The house wren is another um, bird of the wood edge and the brush. They're actually nicknamed the boss of the brushland. And they can be quite tenacious. They are totally protected under the Migratory Bird Act, but they do some destroying. 
and uh, the male will go around to any hole that he sees within his territory and he will go in, pierce the eggs, or even throw out babies. Um, so there's some, there's some tips and tricks that we have if you have uh, bluebirds or tree swallows nesting and you're in house wren habitat. But we highly, highly recommend that you place your boxes for bluebirds and tree swallows, a minimum of 40, but preferably 50 yards. That's half a football field out from an edge that will help to prevent some heartache later. Their nest is constructed of sticks. They love to use multiflora. So when you stick your hand in there um, to monitor, you're definitely going to get pricked. Uh, but that's part of the love-hate relationship you get with working with these birds. Next is the tufted titmouse. And uh, Paula took all three of these pictures. I'm going to have her jump in and talk about the titmouse. Um, the, the titmouse does a, a lunging snake display when you open the box. It is quite impressive and a bit scary. And the only way I got the shot without shaking like crazy is I was telling Amanda was to hold my camera up and just see if I could get it without actually looking at it because she's, she's a scary little thing. And um, <laughs> these pictures, now you'll see this box up on the top right, and you're going to say, well, Paul, you said don't put it on a tree. Well, you're not supposed to put it on a tree, but um, these titmice were successful there. That, that box was actually spaced there, placed there for white-breasted nuthatches. That's what that box is meant to be, but uh, the titmouse used it instead. And I also had a nest with me one other time on a box I actually have nailed to my house. Again, probably not a good idea. But I do watch them join close. Now, the little guy in the bottom right, I named him Don King, <laughs> and I think it's kind of obvious why I named him Don King, but... Uh, that was my first nest of tufted titmice a couple years back, and he decided to jump out of that box a little early, and I saw him sitting there where I took his picture. He let me get about two feet from him, and I just picked him up, and I popped him back in the box because I knew he wasn't quite ready yet. I think maybe one of his brothers or sisters shoved him out when they were trying to get food, and he stayed in there, and then he fledged and he was supposed to. It's a lot of fun having titmice nest uh, close by. And something I try to do if I'm putting up nest boxes uh, at a school, either an elementary school, middle school, or high school, um, I like to work with different habitats to let the kids see what will nest there. So the Carolina wren um, will take to a nest box. Right now I have a female incubating at a new site. And it is somewhat shrubby, brushy, and a tall field area near water. So we thought we had tufted titmice, but they showed us. And uh, her, her nest is normally all dried leaves. But this time, she had a nest that looked like a tufted titmouse nest. And we went up to monitor, and out flew this brown bird. And it was definitely a Carolina wren. Um, go ahead, Paul. I just wanted to mention that when Darlene was talking about the house wren before, we were describing the, uh, the what, destructive behavior of tossing out eggs. And Carolina wrens are good neighbors. They do not do that. So they're, they're a wonderful, curious little bird. I just love these guys. And they're wonderful to ha have nesting with you if you can attract them. We also have plans for a different type of box, one that we call a Carolina wren box. So I was surprised that they nested in the nest box. I've only had that happen maybe a handful of times, and it's an inch and a half open box, just like a bluebird box. Um, and Amy, I see that you asked, do house wrens destroy all nearby nests? And yes, house wrens will uh, go in and pierce the eggs of, of any nest they can find, if it's an open nester or a cavity nester. So up on the top left, that's the Carolina wren box that we have on the plans on the OBCI site. Very easy to build, and they like to have it placed under an overhang. Um, also, they're opportunist, and they'll nest wherever they want to. So this was Paula's husband's motorcycle helmet in the garage. He didn't get to ride with a helmet for a while. Um, and they also have nested in a turned upside down uh, canoe uh, using the bench 
the seat as a place for a nest. Uh, they'll nest in boots sitting outside, clothes hanging on the clothesline, and this little decorative box is in Paula's side yard, and she said they had a nest in every compartment. Did they finish it off, Paul? No. I mean, they, they haven't laid eggs, which is probably a good thing. And Paul's going to talk about the martins. The purple martins, that's, that's sort of my passion, one of them, obviously. I also love the other birds, but purple martins, I, I fledged 356 last year. So I think I kind of know. I'm learning what I'm doing anyway. Um, purple martins, the, the main, what you need for success with purple martins, you, again, habitat and the proper kind of a box. But, but what people have to remember is for these birds to be successful, there's a certain responsibility that comes with housing any native cavity nesting bird. And, and to keep out uh, non-native invasive and uh, other management things you need to do with these birds, you really need to lower the boxes and look in them, uh, ideally every five days. But I generally do it about seven days because I'm busy doing so much stuff. And, uh, and it's important to keep the non-native invasive European starlings and house sparrows out. And you have to protect them with a baffle because you could lose your entire colony probably in one evening if a raccoon climbed up there. And they can climb these poles, yes. Um, what else? We've got little girls on this slide that are, Darlene was banding my purple martins at, at uh, South Bass Island, and these little girls were helping, and it was so much fun to share this with the kids. Uh, they love also, when I change their nest, that's another important management thing we have to do, especially in the Midwest. We get a terrible parasite load. I do not use chemicals in any nesting cavity, and I would never do that, but I remove their dirty nesting material and put in clean pine needles after the young, or they have to be at least a week old to do that, and then we do that. One other thing we do between nest checks with any of the species of birds is we use the, you know, the alcohol hand sanitizer. We go through jugs of it every season. So between each nest, we're cleaning our hands, and we're not using chemicals um, on our clothes either. Uh, we do to deal with ticks and chiggers a lot. I think last year was the worst chigger year that I've ever had. It was awful. <laughs> We also want to keep the native um, cavity nesters out of the purple martin rig, and I'm fighting a tree swallow right now who feels pretty proud of himself that he's found a whole uh, rack of 12 gourds, and he thinks he has it all to himself. I'll say the key, too, with that management, there's all sorts of little tricks and things that, that I've learned over the years, but um, I'll just mention that actually all of my purple martin rigs the really successful ones are in tree swallow grids, which most people would say, you know, with that competition, how does that work? Well, the way it works is you don't put up your martin housing until the martins return. If you see people that leave their housing out all year, that's just asking for problems. You're inviting all sorts of other birds to use that, the worst of which would be your non-native birds. Um, but I don't open it up until the martins return. And then the other trick is you have to cite uh, a pair of boxes about 10 feet from the martin rig. And what this does, you're putting a tree swallow bluebird pair of boxes there. Those birds start nesting earlier, and they'll accept those boxes. And now when another of their species shows up, when you have the martin rig up, they're going to chase them out of there. So it, it, you're actually using the, the territory requirements of other native cavity nesting birds to protect your purple martin colony. Works very, very, very well. And one other thing about purple martins, the equipment is rather costly. But again, it's really important to have equipment that you can lower, equipment that you can trap in. And what uh, we've been doing, we've been writing grants. And a lot of our equipment is put up on very public areas. And we have been uh, having just tremendous success with writing grants. So I don't want to jinx it because we're getting ready to write another one. So why is nest monitoring important? Paul and I are both very avid um, with keeping really good records and entering that information on Cornell Nest Watch. We were really lucky in February we got to meet Jason Martin, who is head of the Cornell Nest Watch program. And we got to um, meet with him. And we have been very, very active. We're both part of um, a core team that uh, he can sound off to. And he knows that we're very active with this. And of course, working with kids. And some of 
the uh, Central Ohio Young Birders kids are in these pictures, um, yeah, as are Paula and I. So it's really important, like Paula said, every four to seven days to get out and monitor, keep good notes, uh, enter your data on NestWatch. NestWatch has terrific, terrific um, sources of great information. Highly recommend that you visit the site and get involved with it if you have NestBox, even if it's just one NestBox in your backyard. Um, it's just a great way to get started. And now they're highly encouraging you to work with the open nesters and to record what you're seeing. And they're doing a lot um, with the big data, as they call it, and universities are coming into the large source of data that Cornell has, and they're starting to uh, do some analytics. It's uh, quite exciting. Okay, now we're going to talk about some problems that, that you're probably going to encounter when you're hosting secondary native cavity nesting birds. Um, the number one problem that I see are house sparrows. They're, they're non-native birds that were introduced to this country in the 1850s. Um, the reason they were introduced, there's a number of different theories as, as to why that is, but uh, some felt that the European people in the cities missed having birds in the city, so they brought these guys in. Others said to control insect pests. Well, actually, it ends up that only 4% of the house sparrow's diet is insects. Mostly they eat seeds, and they can really just, you know, devastate some farmers' crops and things. Um, and eating your livestock feed probably isn't appreciated by the farmer either. But the main problem we have with bird conservation is that uh, these guys are very aggressive. And again, since the majority of their diet are seeds, they have a nice seed cracking beak. Well, it ends up that the seed cracking beak is an excellent head cracking beak as well. And you can see on that bottom left picture that a male bluebird lost his life to a house sparrow. And we do see some of this every season, unfortunately. Um, it's, we did try not to get too vivid with the picture, but I could have shown you worse than that. Uh, so what, uh, let's go to the next slide. So to show you what we look for when we're monitoring boxes, you can see a picture. Here's their eggs on the bottom left. Um, here's a, what a house sparrow nest would look like on the bottom right. It's kind of a messy nest. And when you approach a box, if you see nest material to the ceiling, you know it's a house sparrow nest. Unless it sticks, and then it's a house wren nest. Mm -hmm. And this shows when I'm looking at a box first time in the spring, I will even set a trap if I know a house sparrow has been sleeping in there. And that's what you can see on the Top right, we call it roosting, and Darlene told me I had to use the word dropping, so I did. <laughs> but that's what, this is what their droppings look like. They're, they're little white, almost hard, little noodly things about a quarter of an inch long. And, and it's good to know your poo, poo. <laughs> your droppings. <laughs> On birds, yeah, as you do this, you get to know what was sleeping in the box. And it, it's a lot of fun as you're monitoring to try and figure out, uh, yeah. But it tells you, again, what uh, the number of broods and things they, they have. They start before any other bird. I'm actually trapping sparrows in, in February and March. So they're in there early. They're not nesting yet then, but they're in the boxes. Now, the cool thing that we do with these house sparrow little brown bodies, we recycle them to Ohio Wildlife Center, where they become uh, part of the food chain. And we feed the accipiters. And also, there's a red-tailed hawk that loves house sparrows. Um, so we're, we're recycling. So we feel that that's really important. And we have several other of our monitors who are really good about dispatching the house sparrows. And you know, they, they literally will call or email me and say, Darlene, we need sparrows and starlings. And we are recycling bags of them. I just see a question here um, about using the mylar strips. Those are called sparrow spookers, and yes, they can be very effective, but they're not foolproof. Um, what I found, because I did use sparrow spookers one season on all my bluebird boxes, and, and then I kind of stopped using them, and I had equal success rates, but that's just because I trap. If I didn't trap, if you have like a single box in your yard and you want to protect that box if you have a native cavity nesting bird, I would highly recommend putting a sparrow spooker on it. Um, right now, I only use them in really bad areas where I have problems. Here you can see uh, house sparrows. This Again, this is what they do. Okay, 
the picture on the right shows a trap, and Paula's going to talk a little bit about the trapping. Okay. Um, we trap the non-native house sparrow in the box. And uh, this is called a Van Ert Universal Sparrow Trap, and that link is also at the end of this on, on the resources. It's a, such a valuable tool, I can't tell you. Uh, this traps the bird live inside the box, and so it's not hurting it in any way, but you do have to monitor you know, every hour or two at the, at the most so that you're checking this all the time because uh, you don't want any bird trapped in, in a box for long. I put a mesh laundry bag over the box after you see that it's been sprung, as you can see here on the right. And then you open the box and the live bird flies in there. Um, and then you deal with it uh, as you need to. And I won't go into details on how to do that, but uh, anyone can email me if they want more information. And my contact is there. On the left, you can see this is, happens to be a trail that was uh, set up near Lake Erie. And I won't say where it is, but obviously unmonitored. And what was happening here were two boxes back to back on a pole. Um, tree swallows were trying to use these boxes and the house sparrow, uh, the female was in one with her nest and eggs and the male was in the other using that one for his bedroom and his, uh, his uh, he was killing anything that went in there. So there was at least four or five there that I pulled out who were dead and he's after another one. So Amy, those two pictures on the left were tree swallows mm -hmm. trying to find a place to nest that were killed by house sparrows. So keeping climbing predators out, that's why we use the baffles. And you've seen those uh, described, or at least pictures of them in several of the photographs. We also have descriptions on the site, the OBCI site, on how to build your own PVC baffle. Um, you want to put it right up within an inch of the bottom of the box. And it needs to be at least 30 inches long. Um, Climbing predators are the second most uh, pr big problem that we have with the birds. Raccoons, of course, raccoons will not just be one raccoon, but it'll be a family of raccoons, and they'll climb up each other's back trying to get into the box. And then snakes. If your nest boxes are too close to branches that are hanging down, you might Cite your box in the spring and think this looks pretty good. Well, once the leaves are out on the trees, it's going to weigh the branches down. And I have had um, snakes in several times in boxes. It's a nice little surprise. <laughs> um, flying squirrels. I've had flying squirrels in the boxes. Also bats, uh, wasps, bumblebees. So there's a variety of different uh, predators. And it's not just a climbing predator. Also, um, Cooper socks and crows and jays will try to get into the boxes. Um, having the extension on the roof helps to keep them out. Um, the avian predator, the Cooper hawk, will land on the box, cause a vibration. The young will stick their head out, thinking the parent's coming to feed, and then the hawk grabs them. So with that longer overhang, then that helps to um, keep them out. Just talk a little bit about uh, one of the, the worst predators of, of birds, obviously, are, are, are uh, domestic cats. So we ask everyone to please keep kitty indoors. Um, it's good for the cat, it's good for wildlife, and it's good for you. Um, find out, uh, you, you can just see here basically what we're talking about. But toxoplasma, people who are familiar with it, it it's a disease that that is uh, devastating especially older people or people with uh, immune system deficiencies. But once you have toxoplasma, you have it for life, is my understanding. And, and the outdoor cats are the way it's mainly spread. And so please keep the cat indoors for, for everyone's health. And then I see that somebody's asking if we've tried ivory soap on the inside of the roof of the box to keep wasps from starting. I've used that. I've also used uh, Vaseline, a thin layer of Vaseline on the inside of the roof. Um, but I also will use a stick to pull, to knock the wasp out. Um, you just, you want to definitely be careful if your monitors are allergic to bee or wasping. So definitely be cognizant of asking folks that are monitoring for you if they are allergic. Make sure they have the, their epistick.
So we're kind of wrapping things up here. We just wanted to mention some of our resources. And um, we have from the OBCI site, Amanda has graciously um, loaded a lot of our documents that we feel that are really important. Um, Ohio Bluebird Society has some great information. Our favorite site is Cialis.org. And to me, it's one of the best um, sites with absolutely fantastic resources and information. And that's Cialis, S, not C. <laughs> um, Nestbox Builder is another really good site. And as Paula said, the inbox trap that we use, the live trap, this is the link to it. And he knows us by first name. And then Cornell Nest Watch, another great site. A lot of times when we just have a backyard bluebirder uh, coming in and they don't want to go through the trouble of building PVC baffle, but they're concerned to have their birds be protected, we will direct them to Wild Birds Unlimited. And we've become great partners with them. And they uh, help us out with uh, a lot of our projects. But they have a really nice pole mounting system and a baffle. Uh, an auger system that's uh, nice to use. And they have sales during the year and that can help you out. So Paula and I both have our contact emails here. And um, I'm working full time, so I usually can't respond to people till evening or weekends. I just want to mention too on Nest Box Builder that um, there's a lot of good plans on that site if you want to build your own box. And I was just given a uh, Triton box by Mr. Tom Comfort. And that I love that box. And, and the plans for that site are on there, too. And uh, I put that box out. And the Bluebirds just started building a nest this morning. They have two inches in there already. I just put that box out two days ago. They like that thing. The Triton. I like it. So do you have any more questions? We've tried to kind of watch on the chat site when you've had questions pop up. I do want to um, you know, encourage you to take kids out, to um, you know, get monitors out there, um, to have training sessions. And Paula and I are available. I realize we're central Ohio, but I do travel and try and go out on weekends and help groups. Uh, last weekend. My young birders were out at Dawes Arboretum in Newark, Ohio, and we installed a 16-box grid. We really try to do a lot of partnering. And again, writing grants is, is just exciting once you see that conservation project go up. Well, brown-headed nuthatches are south um, and out west. So I have mm -hmm. seen them going in and out of the boxes. Mm -hmm. Where are you located that you have brown-headed mm -hmm. nuthatches? Mm -hmm. Are they up in Michigan? No. No. OK. Alabama. Oh. And do we put up nest boxes for woodpeckers? No, they, the only nest box that we'll put up for woodpeckers are flickers. Flickers have a softer beak. And they will take to a nest box. As you might imagine, there's huge competition with European starling and flickers. Um, but as far as the other woodpeckers, they want to go back to the resource. OK. Um, they want to excavate their own hole. And what I tell people is the primary cavity nesters will excavate three times a season. The male will excavate, the female will excavate, and then together, once they're ready to breed, uh, they will excavate that third hole. So it's so important, uh, the work that the primary cavity nesters are doing to help the secondary cavity nesters. We're just checking to see if we've tried to answer all your questions. And feel free to um, you know, email Paul or I if we can help. One other thing that I'm, I'm doing is birding by kayak. And I have an area. Uh, it's not Hoover Nature Preserve, like Charlie Bombasi has. But I do have some areas that are conducive to attracting prothonotary warblers. And I have nest boxes out. And we are getting prothonotaries to nest in the box and then entering the data on Nestwatch.
Do you prefer the nest box with a hinged opening or a slide down side opening? Um, to me, definitely a hinged opening, but uh, slide down side. I know what you're talking about. I think the ones that have little windows in them, I don't like those. And, and the birds seem not to like them either. I don't think they have enough insulation in the side. The, the slide down tends to be this really thin little quarter inch piece of wood. And it's got this uh, little window thing in there. Plexiglass. And, yeah, plexiglass. And I mean, when you're monitoring birds, oftentimes you have to um, get in there and take care of problems. And that means you don't want that plexiglass in your way. So I would never purchase one of those. The hinged openings are the way to go. Some people prefer side opening. Some prefer front opening. Some mm -hmm. prefer top opening. As long as you can open that box and easily monitor and clean it out, whatever opening you like is good. <laughs> So we have a question. My 13-year-old asks, what bird is the most dangerous to these birds? So I assume you mean to the secondary cavity nesters, and I would definitely say um, the house sparrow. And he is definitely the most dangerous. A lot of the work that we're doing is in a suburban area. And uh, of course, suburban areas have a lot of bird feeders, have a lot of nooks and crannies. Um, so we are, are definitely dealing with a lot of problems with house sparrows. And if you let them take over, if you don't trap them, then all bets are off. So we're trying to read another question here. Um, so we're not quite sure we understand maybe um, Helena. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to um, try to respond to you offline. Maybe if you could email us. Send us a picture and John Lappin. John Lappin is great. Um, I actually I've oh, he I made know the him. box. She's talking about okay, and I can look and see if he has something online because I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, I'm thinking of something else. When I was talking about that, I, I bought a chickadee box that had that slide down thing with plexiglass, and it's it's not a very good box. I got it from a hardware store, not from John. Uh, No, the birds usually don't uh, fight with your hand as you go in. Um, I, I will say that the first time I reached in to get a chickadee to band, uh, an adult, and a tufted titmouse adult, they did bite. They didn't fight, but they um, did pinch with their beak. Uh, the other birds, the bluebird and the tree swallow, I've not had any problem with that, and of course the martins. There is a certain way that we're taught as a bander to handle the bird. So um, I usually have the bird in that type of hold when I bring it out of the box. Um, so I, I don't have that much of a problem with birds fighting. Uh, Amy's saying, I had no idea sparrows were so destructive. Well, yeah, that's how I, a little story with Darlene, that's how I got into this. I found my first dead bluebird babies, and she's the one that taught me what had happened, but they're, they're incredibly destructive, yes. Okay, do we have any any other questions? And again, we look forward, you know, to hearing from you, hearing what type of work you're doing. Um, you know, if you need some help and we could try to help you either online or by phone or maybe coming out. Um, you know, we we would definitely be open to providing some assistance. We are pretty passionate about what we do. I consider this my hobby out of control. <laughs> and how high up should the boxes be placed? Um, what we say is it should be at a comfortable monitoring height for you. We don't want you up on a step ladder falling off. So for most people, it's about five feet, basically as high as you can get them to you know help keep cats from jumping on them. Uh, if you have cats outside, but uh, but cover for you to monitor when you open the box. And Lloyd Marshall, I wondered if you'd be on this call today. Nice <laughs> to see your name. And Nestwatch would like for you to monitor every three to four days, and that's more with the open nesters. But they are excited and eager to have your data. Um, so I've never heard that they don't want it um, if you are only monitoring once a week. I generally am only monitor once a week, but again, I do so many boxes, there's no way I could do it every three to four days. Although this time of the year, I do, um, when the bluebirds are just starting to lay eggs, I like to kind of keep track, so I am doing about a four-day thing right now. 
and I was up four times last week, so I was a little insane with working. Mm -hmm. By the way, Lloyd Marshall, I happen to have met him this year. He's doing some fantastic work up in Northeast Ohio, and uh, hats off to you, Lloyd, for um, the work in your retirement years um, and what you're giving to the birds. And I hope many of you can, you know, have as much enjoyment uh, and doing this hobby. Is there a box that sparrows cannot go into? No, <laughs> there is not. Uh, the problem with the sparrow, the size of the bird, well, I shouldn't say that. That is not true. If you are just wanting to house house wrens or chickadees, again, as Darlene explained, you can put on a box with a one eight, one eight inch hole restrictor on it, and then house sparrows cannot get in there. But if you're trying to raise bluebirds or anything larger than a chickadee or a house wren, uh, sparrows can get in there too. They're, they're that size of a bird. Um, there's some things you can do to, uh, again, you guys can email me if you have any questions. This is Paul. Amanda's going to, I think, close us out here. Okay, thanks for all your great questions. And again, um, if you have any um, questions for our presenters, their contact information is posted on our website at obcinet.org. Um, also on our website, um, three days from today, a recording of this webinar will be posted. And we'll also post um, the PowerPoint slides. So if there's any um, additional information you wanted to get, especially that resources page, um, that will be available to you as well. So um, thank you again for attending today. And I hope you all join us um, next month. Again, the um, second Wednesday of every month um, from 12 to 1 um, will be our Wednesday webinar series. So thank you again for attending today.